Hey everybody, uh, I am Mary from Mary's Heirloom Seeds and welcome to my weekly live chat. Uh, today we are talking about planting for pollinators and I will, um, I'm going to scoot up a little bit and see if I can, hopefully you can see me. For those of you just joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you that join me regularly, welcome back. I am Mary at Mary's Heirloom Seeds and every week I try to go live here on my YouTube channel and share with you some informational uh, tips, tutorials, all that fun stuff about different things in the garden. So today we are talking about plant for pollinators. Hey hog legs, thanks for joining us. We got some locals here joining me tonight. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't already, hit that thumbs up on our video and I would appreciate it. So probably what you might be thinking is, why are we talking about planting for pollinators in January? Hey Robert, thanks for joining us. Why are we talking about planting for pollinators in January when some of us are in a little bit of a cold snap and some of us not? Some of us might be under snow and some of you like those of you in Florida might be growing right now, especially after that cold snap you had. The reason I chose January for my Plant for Pollinator series, I think this is my third year going, because a lot of us that have colder weather in winter, we start planning our gardens in January. So I wanted to give you an opportunity and it kind of explained to you why planting for pollinators was so important. And I wanted to do that in January to give you a chance to include pollinators in your garden. Or I should say, excuse me, got to see here. Uh, hey, uh, Kay Fist, thanks for joining us. So now is the time where some of you, like I mentioned, are planting your garden. So we want to incorporate pollinator friendly plants in our garden so that we can reap the benefits. And I'll explain to you in just a second. But before we get started into the meat and potatoes of our video, I wanted to share with you a couple of updates. In the description section of this video, you will find a link to my comprehensive planting guide. I refer to that often, as well as a link to our email sign up. We have sent out some amazing announcements recently. And if you aren't signed up for my emails, you're probably missing out on some pretty awesome stuff. So recently we sent out an email for a seed giveaway uh, that is going on right now. So if you go to Mary's Heirloom Seeds and you go to Mary's blog, you'll find the seed giveaway announcement. We also have a seed sale, a massive seed sale that ends on January 10th at midnight. So that's also at Mary's blog. But what I also sent out was two printable downloads for storage and for um, seed starting. So I discussed that last week, um, the two principles that I shared. But what I didn't share was the awesome stuff that Lisa at the Self-Sufficient Home Acre has shared as well, specifically for the video. And that included like a printable for garden planning, for uh, garden journaling. So there's a lot of great information that we have shared that has is free. Pretty awesome stuff actually, so I'm super excited about that. So without further ado, let's discuss some of the reasons that we plant for pollinators and why we discuss it here in January. So hey, Deborah Dixon, thanks for joining us. Let me take a little sip of my tea here. I got a, a cat mug tonight. So during this entire series, I discussed different ways that we can plant with nature, and that is planting for pollinators. Did you know that there was a study that increasing pollinators to specific crops was more beneficial than having adequate water and adequate nutrients? So that means that in the study that they did, that they had reduced water and reduced fertilizer, but the beneficial, but the benefits of pollinators were more important. Hey, Harold, thanks for joining us. Nice to see you tonight. So that is one of many reasons why I like to plant for pollinators because it can increase crop production in your own home garden without having to worry about 
added fertilizers, and of course we have water issues here and there. So the benefits of including the pollinators in your garden are pretty awesome, and that's just one of many things. Pollinators are needed in production of 90% of flowering plants and one third of the crops that we humans eat. So a third of our crops depend on it. Now granted, some things you can hand pollinate, but again, there are studies that show that plants that were pollinated by pollinators, such as strawberries, for example, they had healthier fruits, sweeter fruits, higher production, and just a better overall crop when you had pollinators instead of just hand and wind pollination. So that is super important. Um, there's a couple of pollinators that just a general uh, list of pollinators, and that includes bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, birds, and bats. But there's some that you don't think about, which when I would volunteer at the schools, the kids were super excited to hear all the different varieties of pollinators, because this is kind of a discussion that I would have when I would go to the middle schools and the elementary schools, the kindergartners, they love that. Lemurs and lizards can also be pollinators. Again, you know, we're in Texas. You probably don't have lemurs in your backyard, but that's kind of a one of many of the unique uh, different pollinators. So we're not planting for lemurs today, but that is one of, of many. Um, and now let's talk about why planting for pollinators is important. Now, during my discussion here, you're more than welcome to, to ask any questions you might have. If I miss your comment, um, please have patience with me because I'm trying to read the comments while I'm live here. Behind me here is one of my favorite pollinators, um, pollinator friendly plants, I should say, and that is calendula. Now, calendula, not only does it attract pollinators, uh, such as bees and butterflies, it is also known to attract some beneficial uh, insects, such as hoverflies, which can help with aphid population. So hoverflies can eat those nasty little aphids that can be bothering your garden. So calendula is also part of our um, seed sale right now. It's one of my favorites. I plant it in my garden every year. Deborah Dixon says pollinators are necessary. I was taught that as a child, bees, ladybugs, lacewings, butterflies. Yes, ladybugs, of course. Ladybugs also will eat aphids. So that's another beneficial that you want in your garden. So we're trying to attract them to our gardens for many, many reasons here. Um, so calendula, let's see, crazy goat lady says, I'd like to plant more flowers for hummingbirds. Thank you for mentioning that because that is on my list to discuss as well tonight. So the name calendula comes from the word calends, which means first day of the month. And it refers to the fact that in some mild regions, you can actually get calendula to bloom year round. So when we were in California and we didn't have as cold a weather as Texas, we did have a lot longer of a season for our calendula, which was nice. Um, the leaves and the flowers of calendula are edible. And I will talk about nasturtium in a couple minutes too, because that's another really good edible um, pollinator friendly plant. Um, now the calendula has high vitamins and mineral content, both for the flowers and the leaves. I personally use the flowers for my calendula salve. Um, my hands and my feet, my elbows, my arms, they get kind of dry during the winter time. Um, maybe I'm not drinking enough water. Maybe it's just because I'm out in the garden or maybe because I'm washing my hands a lot more. Hey, Linda, thanks for joining us. So the calendula infused oil is amazing. Um, in our videos, as well as online, we have the recipe to make your own calendula infused oil. It is so easy. You literally take that calendula flower, you, I prefer to dry the flower first. You use the, I use the seeds and the leaf and the um, petals. You can use just the petals if you want. Hey Sandy, thanks for joining us. 
But if you use the seeds, you, you can basically take this entire seed head, allow it to dry, and then use it to make your calendula infused oil. The reason I use it as a dry product instead of using it fresh is because there's less water content. And when you're making your own creams and oils, less water content means it won't go rancid. Um, or at least it won't go rancid as fast. I pretty much use it up before it goes rancid because we use that often here because it, it is really, I call it my garden helper because again, you're outside, your hands get cracked. Um, and so it's really nice to calm everything down. So hummingbirds, oh my goodness, hummingbirds are so awesome. Um, Rewilder Life says calendula inf infused tallow butter is nice, very nice. I will be rendering my own tallow very soon. We just got a um, little bit of a harvest from that from a local farmer. So stay tuned for that. I might have some more information. Um, so Scarlet Runner Bean is an excellent crop to grow in your garden to attract hummingbirds. So it's not necessarily something you would think about. It's not a flower specifically, it's a bean. But the beautiful red flowers of the Scarlet Runner Bean are fantastic to attract hummingbirds to your garden. Um, but there's some other things that you can do as well. Um, mostly brightly colored um, tubular flowers are really important. So if you are, look, you've got things like um, columbines, daylilies, Lupine's really good. We don't carry foxglove, but that's another one as well. Hollyhocks, we do carry those. So those are great to, in, um, to encourage hummingbirds to your garden. Uh, Linda says, I've planted calendula several times and I've had not a very good luck. What am I doing wrong? It really depends on what you're doing. If you, um, you can send me an email. By the way, you can always send me an email for those of you watching me. My email is mary at mary's heirloom seeds.com. So if there's something specific you're looking for, you can always reach out and, and ask. You can also go to our comprehensive planting guide, Linda, and in the description section of this video, you'll find the link. And there is a guide to growing calendula from seed. So that will take you through the basics of growing calendula from seed. Again, I, it, there's a lot of different factors. Um, if the soil has to be warm enough, the seeds have to be sown deep enough, but not too deep. It has to be plenty warm in the soil. And it does take a while to germinate. I think calendula in general is like up to 14 to 21 days to germinate. So sometimes we're just not giving it enough time. So there's a lot of different factors. Taking a drink. Sorry, guys. Dill. Dill. It can attract swallowtail butterfly caterpillars. So dill is an amazing crop that you can grow outside your garden, inside your garden, and let those caterpillars snack. Uh, generally, we get I, I get questions that say, hey, this bug is eating my garden. What am I going to do? And if it's a swallowtail butterfly, please don't kill it. Uh, if it's a monarch butterfly caterpillar, please don't kill it. Uh, there are so many beneficial caterpillars out there that will become butterflies that we need in our gardens. And the more we treat and spray and smash and kill, the less, the less likely we will have a growing population of beneficial insects in our garden. So dill is one, again, that will attract swallowtail butterfly caterpillars. Zinnia is a great one that will attract uh, bumblebees and butterflies to your garden as well. Hey, Matt, thanks for joining me as well. Um, Linda says, thanks, I will look for that guide or send you an email. Please do. If there's something that isn't addressed specifically, please send me an email. I'm more than happy to help. Fennel and parsley, again, yep, those are on my list. They are fantastic for butterfly caterpillars. Uh, so we wanna encourage them into our garden. Plant a little extra dill. So if you purchased from Mary's Heirloom Seeds recently, maybe a couple months ago or something, for the last couple months in 2022, I was including, uh, see, hang on just a minute, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I have Jojo was trying to get in and he he needed to come in and see us so sorry about that I had to have a little bit of a break he was letting me know that he didn't like being locked out of his room uh, so <laughs> If you've seen older videos, you've seen Jojo. There isn't a spot for him to come sit with me now. Um, so there's a couple of different varieties that you can include in your garden as well. Crimson Clover is a great option for early bee food. That's one of my favorites. I We drive around um, the different back roads in East Texas here. We're in East Texas, for those of you that don't know. Crimson Clover is growing everywhere, all along the sides of the roads, the highways, the freeways, the county roads, the farm to market roads, they are everywhere. So Crimson Clover is a really good one for early bee food. Dandelion is another one for early bee food. And for some reason, some company decided to, uh, put this idea in people's heads that we needed to use an herbicide to spray dandelions in your uh, grass because it's unsightly. Um, I would prefer to have a bee-friendly property than to have a manicured lawn. Uh, sure, grass has its place because it keeps the soil from eroding, but if it means poisoning our pollinators or poisoning our water table, I would much rather have weeds than grass. So dandelion is another really good one for you that would be great to add in your garden. Um, dill, fennel, parsley, zinnia, we, I mentioned scarlet runner bean and now calendula. So I wanna talk to you before I go about what I have behind me. January is plant for Pollinators Month at Mary's Heirloom Seeds. So if you are placing an order during our Plant for Pollinators Month, you're gonna receive two free seed packs with your order. One is gonna be a food crop. Uh, I don't know what it is right now because we have a lot of different varieties that we're giving away. The next is going to be a pollinator friendly variety. Now, I have here, my insert that goes with every single order placed in the month of January. Um, I also have these nifty postcards. My sister made the graphic for me and it's perfect for a postcard. Um, Matt says, with my wife and my love for perennial flowers, so our farm will never be short of flowers for pollinators. I like to hear that. So we've got a postcard. Hey, Littlefoot Ranch, thanks for joining us. You're also in East Texas as well. Hey, neighbor. Um, I'm learning in Texas that you could be very far away, but you're still a neighbor because you're it's such a large area that you're just down the road, even if you're a couple hours away. <laughs> we went to visit my mom's friends and they were two hours away. And it was like no big deal to just get in the car and drive two hours and have lunch and come back. So it's really nice to see them though. They were... Uh, family friends I hadn't seen in years. So anyway, back to the pollinators. <laughs> uh, Littlefoot says, so true about Texas. Yep. So again, we have this plant for pollinators insert that's going in all of our January orders. And we also have the postcard. Now this isn't printed on the back. This one might be, I'm not sure. Oh, it is. Nice. Um, so on the back, because this is a monarch butterfly, on the back of our, our postcard is printed with monarch butterfly and milkweed information. Here's the thing. Milkweed is the food for the caterpillar, but monarch butterflies need food also. So we have to, if we're looking for a general pollinator friendly garden, we need to consider the food that the caterpillar will eat as well as the nectar that the butterfly needs or the bees need or the hummingbirds. So there's a lot of different aspects of growing a pollinator garden. And 
there's a lot available. And I don't, I don't mean to share all this information to make you um, overwhelmed. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or expensive. You could literally take a pack of free seeds and spread them out in an area and that is your pollinator spot. Um, but one thing I do need to stress because I briefly mentioned about spraying herbicides, please, please consider growing organic. And I don't mean using organic herbicides and pesticides. I mean, let's try and grow what I call beyond organic standards. Now, what that means is we're trying to grow with nature and try to work with the different pests that and, and pollinators and things that we have and not necessarily spray every single thing in the garden. Uh, and it's very hard if you have been growing conventionally and then you're trying to grow organically. It's not easy, but it's possible. And I'm more than happy to help. So if you have questions, like I mentioned to Linda, please send me an email, check out my website, check out the comprehensive planting guide. I will help you. Matt says, do you interplant pollinators in your veggie rows or do you alternate rows of flowers and veggies? Great question. So I have a video that I will share um, I did it in 2020, so a couple years ago, um, and I discussed how you could interplant pollinators in your garden. So I grow in raised beds mostly. It, when I had, uh, in 2020, we were in California, and I was growing 100% in raised beds because we had gophers. But now I'm growing mostly in raised beds because the the largest garden that I built, it flooded, meaning that water like ran through it and it got sloshed and muddy and it was just easier for me to put raised beds in the area that flooded. So in the video, I discussed that I do interplant. So for example, uh, companion planting for tomatoes includes borage, marigold, and basil, just as an example. And you could, because that tomato plant might take up a little more space if you're using the square foot garden method, what you could do is you've got a square for your tomato plant and then you have one, two, three sides that it might be expanding into. And what you could do is you could plant um, pollinator friendly companion plants in those squares and just give the tomato a little space and that way you've got, you're not wasting too many squares, but you also are encouraging pollinators. So borage is one of my favorite pollinators. It is, um, I have a silly little video that's the borage brings all the bees to the yard because that plant is covered in bees every year. So that's a really good one for you if you want. Um, now when I do rows, cause I do have rows, I will generally plant within my row um, because I typically want those pollinator plants close and not too far away. So to answer your question, not only do I interplant in my raised beds, I also interplant in my rows so that I, I tend to not do just a straight row of tomatoes or a straight run of um, peppers. I'll do tomato, basil, tomato, basil, and so on and that way, um, one, I'm utilizing the space a little better, and then also I'm including pollinators as well. So part of, like I was mentioning early, earlier, our plant for pollinators, um, it's not a kit, but it's a fun little gift that I'm including. Um, so you have this postcard, and then you have monarch, butterfly, and milkweed information. And it explains the different types of milkweed um, monarchs utilize about 30 different species of milkweed, which is pretty awesome. Um, but typically they will use two in particular that they prefer, and that is swamp milkweed and common milkweed. Um, and one caterpillar, one monarch caterpillar 
can eat over 20 milkweed seeds in its lifetime. So I've seen a lot of people going, hey, I bought this monarch or I, I bought this milkweed plant and it's already eaten it and I need more. So if you're planning on feeding the milkweed caterpillars, you might want to plant more than one seed for more than one plant. And you definitely do not want to treat those plants. Don't treat it with organic stuff. Don't treat it with spraying it with water if you have aphids, because the problem is if you're spraying off those aphids with water or soapy water or neem oil, you might also be spraying off the eggs for future monarch butterfly caterpillars. Um, and then there's also a list of 10 long blooming flowers that will attract butterflies and hummingbirds. So that's a really cool one. And last but certainly not least, you also have kind of cool, a matching, oops, upside down, <laughs> a matching sticker, which is just kind of a fun little insert and then a free seed. So this week, the free gift from Mary's Heirloom Seeds is Zinnia Mix. Uh, I can't say that it's my favorite, but I will say it's in my top favorites. I would have to say I have a top five for pollinators and I can't narrow it down. Please don't ask me my favorite. <laughs> um, calendula is one of them. Zinnia is one of them. Uh, what else? Uh, I already mentioned it before. Uh, borage is another one. So that's three of them. Nasturtium would be number four and sunflowers would be number five. So if I personally had to pick my top five for pollinators, and I'm not saying, okay, so I'm not saying this is the top five best. I'm saying the top five, my personal favorites, because <laughs> it's, it's going to vary for everybody. And you could talk to five different pollinator experts and they'll probably give you six different answers. So who really is going to be right? And I don't necessarily think there's a right answer as much as it is a personal preference. So again, I'll rattle those off. My top five uh, planting for pollinators is calendula, zinnia, borage, nasturtium, and sunflower. And I'm not even saying that, that it's in that order, but I do love those five um, pollinator-friendly plants. Some of them can be medicinal, all of them are, oh, well, some of them are edible. Um, I mentioned earlier, I was gonna share with you about nasturtiums. Nasturtium leaves, flowers, and seeds are all edible. If you want to eat the seeds, you want to harvest them when they are green, not when they are, are tougher because the seeds don't taste that great at that point. Um, the outer shell is a little too tough but if you harvest them when they're green and young, they are completely edible and delicious. A lot of people will um, pickle them and use them for like similar to a caper. And so that's another option for you. But I love the versatility of the nasturtiums because they, they do bring pollinators to your garden, but they're also delicious. Um, I love nasturtium flowers. They are peppery and they give you a nice little kick to whatever you're, you're topping. I don't normally cook them, I just eat them raw. Harold at the Modern Homesteading Podcast, love your channel by the way, says that's a great list. I know the bees love the flowers on my comfrey as well. Thank you, that's an excellent, um, that's an excellent suggestion. So the back side of my plant for pollinators when I talk about the benefits, I also give you a brief rundown about how to start the specific varieties from seeds. There's not every single pollinator friendly variety listed here, but it is the basics and it will help you get started specifically for your seeds. So that is it for me tonight. I thoroughly enjoyed sharing with you all of this information about pollinators, just throwing it all at you. Um, if you have questions, like I mentioned earlier, you can send me an email. My personal email is Mary at Mary's heirloom seeds.com. I answer every email you send me, uh, unless it's spam. Sorry. If you're trying to sell me something, I probably won't answer it. Um, but I will answer if you don't see a response, 
please check your spam folder because a lot of a lot of times when you say when you think hey you know mary's ignoring me she didn't get back to me it's probably in your spam folder um and then hoglet says question should we start indoors or outdoors so that's a great question some of the varieties again um another thing is if you want this insert and you want to be able to print it yourself you can send me an email and i will send you a printable version of this um some of the varieties that are plant or bee friendly are pollinator friendly they do require cold stratification so in that case you're going to want to either a winter sow so that you get a cool area hog legs i know you're in texas because we've met before um you want to make sure that that one in particular say um let's see look at my uh, looking at my list coneflower which is echinacea it requires cold stratification so you can either plant it outside in containers or in the ground allow it to freeze which is the natural way of cold stratification or I have a video and I have a description in the comprehensive planting guide about cold stratification. You can put it in the freezer. I don't do the freezer. You or you can put it in the fridge, which I definitely use the fridge. I will typically refrigerate those seeds in either sand or coconut core. I prefer coconut core for six weeks. If you have someone in your household that likes to clean out the refrigerator, please warn them that that is for cold stratification. I've had customers very upset that someone threw out their seeds that if they had been cold stratifying for however long. Hey, Sunny's Place, thanks for joining us. Comfrey, for example, Harold mentioned comfrey. That requires cold stratification if you're starting it from seed. So you can either, like I said, winter sow or Pop it in the refrigerator in some moist coconut core, and then you're good. Matt says stick it in the fridge. I stick it in the fridge because there's a lot going on out, out in the garden and out in the property during winter time. And it's just easier for me to plan ahead by cold stratifying in the refrigerator. And then uh, to more specifically answer your question, hog legs, when I cold stratify, I then plant those seeds in containers under light in my grow tent, because I have a grow tent, we've talked about that before, and, and they typically germinate within 30 days after the cold stratification. Now, if you're talking about zinnia, for example, that doesn't need to be cold stratified, you can do one of two things. You can plant it indoors four weeks before your last frost date that's going to be your spring frost date or you can direct sow in the garden right after your last frost date your last frost date is going to be the end of the winter frost date the coldness when we go into the warmness and i personally use the old farmer's almanac to uh, determine my estimated frost date for my area. And then what I do is when we get closer to that date, for example, if the old farmer's almanac says March 1st, I just look at my forecast around that time and determine whether it's going to be good to plant outside. Sunny's Place, you said the fridge is a great stratification, except when your hubby decides to clean it out and throw it away. Exactly. I had two customers in particular that were so devastated. They put their comfrey in the refrigerator for however long, and then they went to plant it out in March, and it was gone. So if you share a refrigerator with someone, please make sure that you let them know, don't throw out those seeds. Um, put a little big note on it, whatever you have to do to make sure that it doesn't get thrown away. Fortunately, I'm the one that cleans out the refrigerator, so I don't have to worry about it. Kay Fisk says, I use milk jugs and clear bottles outside for cold stratification in zone 7B. So again, uh, Kay Fisk is discussing uh, what I refer to as winter sowing. Um, and that's when you're literally sowing your seeds in winter to allow nature to take its course. 
So if you don't want to do the refrigerator and whatever else that I do, it's totally fine. There are, I would say there are like five different ways to plant, generally speaking. And some people do one, some people do all. <laughs> so there isn't a one size fits all for everyone. And that's kind of why I have this channel and why I'm so active on different social media sites because I just try to give you as much information as possible so that you can um, have the most awesome garden possible. Matt says, right in the butter compartment on the door of the fridge behind the butter so they don't fall out. That's a great idea. All right, everybody. I'm gonna go uh, have some dinner and enjoy the rest of my evening. Uh, we are busy shipping out seed orders as quickly as possible, which is pretty awesome right now. It's January. This is probably the busiest month at Mary's Heirloom Seeds. January through March, actually. So um, we get as much done as humanly possible and we work some pretty long hours right now. So thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate all of you that joined me here for my live chat tonight. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel. Hit that thumbs up for our video so that everybody can see it. Share it on your social media pages. We all need to do um, what we can to plant for pollinators this year. It is so very important. It will benefit all of us in the long run to have more beneficial pollinators available in our gardens. If you have any questions, send me an email to mary at maryshairlimseeds.com. Check out the uh, Mary's blog right now after my live chat. We have a giveaway that is free to enter. I've got a seed sale that is live until the 10th and it is awesome. I'm telling you, it's awesome. Uh, there's a lot of pollinator varieties in there as well. So thanks, Harold. Thanks, Sunny's Place. Uh, I'm Mary at Mary's Heirloom Seeds signing off and happy planting.